as Christians, we are, are given, uh, it doesn't take long, we start getting images of what we are looking for when Jesus comes back, right? You, we, the Messiah, he came, we know he, did, he, he died, he was buried, he was resurrected, he ascended back to the Father, and, and we're told he's coming back. So we're given little pictures that we can look forward to that gives us a clue, like something big is happening, the Messiah ha, has come back. Verses like 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord himself would ascend from heaven with a shout, uh, the art angel's voice and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So that's like an image where there's also a, a, an audio thing like a, there's, a, there's a shout and there's a trumpet and then there's like the dead in Christ rising. I don't know if we see that or not but we know it's, we know it's happening somehow so there's some things to look for. Revelation 19 tells us when I saw heaven opened, there was a white horse. Uh, its rider is called faithful and true with justice and he judges and makes war. Uh, so, so there's a visual of a horse, right? A rider on a white horse on, uh, going after war, conquest, right? It is the idea of Revelation 19. Uh, chapter 6 of Revelation says the sky was split apart like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Those are visuals, those are images. We have the sky opening up, being receded like a scroll, mountains and islands being removed. Now, we don't know exactly what that looks like, but we know it's supposed to happen. And when that happens, if you're driving down the road and all of a sudden there's a trumpet that kind of goes through your soul and that has an unearthly sound to it, and, 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 and the sky splits open and recedes like a scroll, and a guy on a white horse starts you know, coming, you, you, you know what's going on. I mean, I mean, it's like you've had the images in, in your mind, in your heart. You, you've looked for that. If you, I don't know if you've ever done like in a rainy day and, like, and the sun's coming through the clouds. You're like, ooh, it's going to look like that. I don't know. It's, it's, we, it's, it's in our minds. We understand what we're looking for. We may not think about it every day, you know. Uh, it might not be something you dream about, it, but, 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 it, but it's something you know at some point it is going to happen. So it won't surprise you. There won't be a shock and awe. You won't be like, oh, no, what's happening? You know, as a Christian, uh, you'll be like, all right. He's here. He's back. It's time to go home. I mean, it's going to be a very positive day for us. So just as we have images in our mind about the second coming of the Messiah, the Old Testament saints had images in their mind of what the first coming of the Messiah would look like. I mean, they didn't know it was the first. We didn't know, you know, there'd be a second. But, but, but all they knew is Messiah was going to come. They spent their whole life talking about Messiah is going to come. And there were different little images that the prophets gave them. There, there were several, but we're going to look at a couple, three today. Uh, and, and again, li like us, I'm sure they didn't think about it every day. Uh, it wasn't something they dwelled on every moment or anything. You live your life. But they would be reminded of these images every year during Passover, part of the focal idea of Passover was, was remember how God provided it and everything, but it was also to, to remind them that a Messiah is, is coming, and it would remind them of some of the images that would be coming. These would be uh, reviewed during the Passover week. Some of the images are found in Zechariah chapter 14, uh, starting in verse 1. It says, look, a day belonging to the Lord is coming when the plunder taken from you will be divided in your presence. So it starts out really bad. This is really not good news for Israel. I will gather, verse 2, all the nations against Jerusalem for battle. The city will be captured, the houses looted, the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be removed from the city. So, so it's, it's terrible. It's a time of awful things going on that, that the Messiah will come. So you know, Because the next few words are the image. This is, but look, look for this. In horrible times, look, look for this moment. Then, verse 3, the Lord will go out to fight. That, that's an image. The Lord is there, and he's going to fight for you. Right? He's going to go out against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Right? There's an image. The Mount of Olives is a, is a place, a specific place they can look for, it, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west, forming a huge valley so that the half of the mountain will move to the north, half to the south. You will Flee by my mountain valley, for the valley of the mountain will extend into Azai, Azal, and you will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. So God himself is going to come in this conquering moment, right? The Messiah is coming. Chapter 14 of Zechariah, verse 9 says, On that day the Lord will become king over the whole earth, 
The Lord alone in his name alone. So not only does he come and fight this battle, but he's going to rule the entire world. It, it, it's not like just one little thing. It's going it's to be a global thing that happens uh, as a result of the Messiah coming. Now, interestingly, there's another little image given a few chapters earlier that, that kind of doesn't make sense to people. And, and so it was like kind of like, okay, we'll just look for that. But in chapter 9, uh, Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. <laughs> this is some pretty good images here. If you like checklists, like like you know, like us, like okay, sky receding, you know, check, uh, trumpet sound, okay, check, shout from okay, check, you know, you, you kind of like you, you put it all together and go, okay, it's time. Uh, they would have had a similar checklist coming out of Zechariah for the first uh, arrival of the Messiah. The Lord's going to be present on on earth. All right. So he's going to be standing on, on the Mount of Olives, right? Uh, he'll be riding on a donkey. That's, that's something to look for. You know, watch for that. He'll become king over the entire world. Now, now what's kind of weird in this little checklist that we have it, it is the, the donkey thing. Why, why would a king ride a donkey? I mean, that, 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 that doesn't make sense. A, a triumphal king. So it's not even like the loser king that the winning king says, ha ha, you're going to ride a donkey. It's the triumphant winning king of the world it's going to be riding a donkey. Not exactly an image of a victory, you know. Uh, they tend, the winning king, victorious kings, tend not to ride donkeys. They tend to ride like impressive uh, horse stallions or something. You know? I mean, something like, like big, meaty, muscular, uh, scary-looking horses. They can walk in and, and, and pompous, you know, and like, look, I'm here I am, you know. And they find the best horse of the land. That's the kind of horse or animal that a, that a king would come as they come into town. And, and after winning a battle, they come in with their glorious animals and, and entourage with them. They will come into town. The citizens will celebrate this victorious battle because it's a victorious king that's coming by laying palm branches at their feet. That's just how they do it. It's just this a part of the celebration. We have like ticker take parades or whatever. They lay uh, palm branches in front of, of the king in, in celebration. So, so donkey's kind of weird. Uh, it's going to be God. It's going to be the king of the world, all these things. And, and, and a donkey. But those are the images that the Old Testament saints had in mind when the coming of the Messiah would come. So they would have that little mental checklist like we have ourselves for things, knowing that the ultimate victory for Israel is, is right in front of them. And so one day, you know, after centuries of people looking, having this checklist, uh, the weirdest thing happens. Jesus is now preparing for the final week of his life on earth as, as the physical uh, uh, deity of God in the flesh, right? He is preparing for this week, and he sets some wheels in motion at the beginning of the week. It's in Matthew 21. Uh, starts in verse 1. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives. Okay, it's just the first half of the sentence there. But, but uh, if, you have, if you have your checklist, pull your checklist out, and you can say, yes. Hmm, okay, Mount of Olives, isn't that interesting? Hey, disciples, let's gather at the Mount of Olives. They don't know what's going on. They have no clue what's about to happen, but that, that's where they meet. So we'll, we'll check that off. It goes on, Jesus sent, then sent two disciples, telling them, well, go into the village ahead of you. At once, you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them and he'll send them at once. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the fall of a donkey. <laughs> so Jesus tells the disciples, hey, go into town, get a donkey, just grab a donkey. You'll be sitting there, don't worry, just, just, just grab these two donkeys. If someone asks what they're doing, just say, ah, oh, the Lord needs them. <laughs> okay? All right, what a clever way to let people know that the Lord is here. Go on to someone's property, untie their donkeys, extremely valuable property, right? And just take them. Just start walking away with them. And, and see if anybody asks, of course someone's gonna ask, hey, what are you doing? I mean, if someone walked into your driveway and hot-wired your car, and, and you know, you'd be like, hey, what are you, get, out, what are you, get out of my car, what are you doing? You'd, you'd ask a question, right? 
course they're going to ask the disciples, what are, you, what are you doing? Like, you can't have my donkeys, right? Well, so they ask, and what do they say? The Lord needs the donkey. It's like, like what? <laughs> Again, uh, if you have your, your check off, this, do I have it there? Yeah, oh, look, look. Uh, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord's in town. What? The Lord's in town. He needs a donkey. Okay, well, that's wild. Okay, check. We'll, we'll, we'll mark that off. Now, honestly, Jesus doesn't need a donkey to come into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. It's a short walk. It's it's not a big deal. I mean, he walks everywhere. This is it's not like, man, I'm really tired. Can you get me a donkey? You know, that's not what's going on here. He didn't need a donkey. He was about to start the week off making a dramatic statement that had not really been made in this public fashion yet. He's about to tell the people, Messiah has arrived. Here I am. You've been waiting for me, here I am. So, the word's starting to spread. The Lord needs a donkey. Like, what? Why do you need a donkey? Why doesn't he get a horse? <laughs> Why doesn't he get a camel? I mean, there's better ways to, tr- to travel than a donkey. Oh, check. <laughs> He's up at the Mount of Olives, you say. Check, okay. Just kind of the back of the mind. You know, kind of keep, that, keep that going. The Lord is here. So, Interestingly enough, this is the beginning of the Passover feast, right? And this, this just happens to be the time when thousands and thousands of visitors come to Jerusalem. And this just happens to be the time when each family selects the perfect lamb they're going to sacrifice. That's just when they do it. It's this the beginning of the week and the festivities happen. And so they go out together and they find a perfect, perfect lamb, but no blemish, it's spotless, it's perfect, fitting all the criteria, and they set it aside and say, here's Here's the lamb. We're going to sacrifice that lamb at the end of the week. Uh, They don't know Jesus is setting himself. He's been selected as the lamb. And that's what he's about to make a very public statement on. The Messiah has come. So he gets on the donkey. Did we read verse 6 yet? Thank you. (laughs) So... (laughs) I thought I was like, wait a minute, I think I jumped ahead of myself here. So yeah, that, it's verse 6. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. Go get the, go get, go get the, go get the donkeys. They brought the donkey and the colt. They laid their clothes on them. They sat on them. And a very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees, spreading them on the road. Why in the world was a random guy coming down Mount of Olives on the donkey when people start laying coats on the ground in front of them because they're getting they're checking off their list they're checking off the list this this is this is unusual this is different this is bigger than that uh, oh by the way if you have your list now you can go ahead and check off riding on the donkey <laughs> things are i mean that's like saying okay the sky has receded uh, the trumpet blew there's a guy on a horse whoa <laughs> okay that that's that's what they're going through old testament style right so, uh, they've checked those things off. They know his purpose is to come to battle. They know his purpose is to come to turn the world upside down. So, already mentally, although it hasn't happened, they're mentally go ahead and checking off, well, he's the king. I mean, the Lord has come. He's coming down on a donkey, coming from Mount of Olives. Obviously, it's time for war. That's what's, that's what's going through the mind. Of, so, crowds are gathering. Let's see who's coming down the mountain on the donkey. Let, I mean, let's see who God has sent. This is incredible. This is amazing. And, and what Jesus is doing as he descends down this hill, it's not like a huge mountain. I mean, it's just coming down the mound, you can almost say, uh, in a very public way for the very first time, here's, I'm your king. I'm the king of Israel, the king of the world. Messiah has arrived. And They do what any good citizen would do in their kingdom when a victorious king comes into their community riding their horse or whatever they're riding, in this case, a donkey. What they do is they lay their cloaks down before the victorious king. It's a sign of victory. It's a sign of, yes, we won the war. It's it's, it's good news. They spread out palm branches as he approaches because that's what first century people do when victories happen and the victorious king comes riding in and everybody knows the Messiah is going to be victorious. Let's let's just get this going. Put down our coat, do the palm branches, and do the thing. Now, uh, today's Palm Sunday, right? And, And all across the globe, churches are celebrating um, and, and 
you know, they're handing people little palm branches, and it's okay, I'm not against that or anything, and, and they're going, Woo! you know, and it's, ha, Hosanna, and they're singing ha, Hosanna songs, and, 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 and uh, they're getting all fun and excited, it's a worship service, hey, celebrate Jesus, you know, um, I want to suggest to you, that's a very different flavor, what we do today, than what happened here, I, 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 I mean, when I was a young child, raised in the Sunday school class, we had the felt board, flannel board, uh, uh, little uh, palm branches, and ah, you know, and we all sing, Hosanna, Hosanna. You know, it was a very happy, happy time. Uh, I just want to suggest, and this is hard for us to grasp sometimes, if you look at the cultural thing that's happening here, I'm going to say uh, it, was, it, was, it was not what was happening in this scene. This, this is not a Michael W. Smith song <laughs> that, uh, you know, it, that was going on here. It, it's not a praise service. It's not a time of worship leading, uh, like the way we would lead worship. Oh, I got tingly feelings. There's Jesus. You know, that, that's not at all what's happening. This is a public declaration of war against Rome. That's what's happening. Put it through that filter here. Every one of these things that are happening are acts of war in a first century Jerusalem. Taking off your cloak, laying it on the ground, is how you show submission to a king as they come down the street. It's their way of saying, I pledge my full allegiance to you, king. I'm, taking, I'm giving you the most valuable possession I have, my cloak. It protects me from the sun and the wind and you know, all this stuff. And, and, and I'm taking it off and I'm laying it down before you, my most prized property, symbolizing that I give you everything. Everything goes to you, my king. Today, I pledge to follow you as our new king and military leader, even if it means I death. I will die for you in this war. That's what goes on when they take their cloak off. It isn't just like, oh, I hope the horses, I hope the donkey doesn't get his hoofs dirty. That's, that's, not, that's not it. It's a declaration of allegiance to fight. Now, for the record, uh, if you live in a country with a king in place, say uh, Caesar or something, and you publicly declare you will die for a new king, I say Jesus, you know, that's enough to get you killed in the first century or even today if you go somewhere in that type of rulership. This was a bold, outlandish moment with the people totally on board to declaring war against the government. And they didn't seem to care because Messiah had come and they know that the governments of the world are about to be flipped upside down and he's about to rule everything. So they're like, we're in. We already know the end of this game. We know the final score. Count us in. Here's my coat, here's the branches, we're totally in. Now, verse nine tells us what the crowd is shouting. The crowds who went ahead of him uh, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Bless this he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Again, sounds like a lot of songs, a lot of cool songs. I love the songs, sing the songs, they're good songs. But they're not worshiping Jesus as the son of the living God right here. They're quoting from Psalm 118, which is part of the Passover tradition. So this is like, it's at the top of their mind right now, where all of Israel prayed for God to deliver them from the foreign country governments, you know, whatever, all through the seasons of, of the, the Jewish people. Uh, in the Passovers, they would pray, deliver us from whoever happens to be oppressing them at, at the moment. Psalm 118, 25 and 26 says, Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. Uh, they're not talking about business dealings. They're talking about war. They help us win this war. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed from the house of the Lord. We bless you. Again, not a worship song. Battle cry. Battle cry. It's the chant that warriors would shout as the king led them out in, into battle. That's what's going on here. The word Hosanna literally means save us. Save us, O king. Save us, son of David. Grant us success in, in the battle that's about to, to, to happen. The, I mean, that's what the soldiers screamed as they would go in to, to, to battle. Verse 10 says, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar saying, who is this? Why? Why would the city be in an uproar? It was just some dude coming down the mountain in a donkey and people like, eh, 
that would that'd be like, okay, that's cool. The cities in an uproar was like, who has declared war? What is going on here? And the word spreading quick, quickly. He's here, Messiah's here, we're going to war. The city is in an uproar because, like, what's coming next? The crowds are saying in verse 11, it's, well, they're answering this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The Messiah is here. It's him. It really is him. The king is gathering his troops. It's time for us to go to battle. It's time for Rome to go down. Now, again, that's a very different flavor than what I uh, learned. Uh, and grew up most of my life uh, viewing Palm Sunday as it's not a cutesy, fun little dance. With, 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 with it, it was, it was a grab your sword. Uh, I'm, I'm ready to die. This government is, is terrible and oppressive, and I can't live here anymore. Uh, Rome. Have you ever wondered um, why in the world would, would the same crowd that was sh- shouting Hosanna? One day, just a few days later, shall crucify him. I mean, it wasn't the exact identical crowd, but there had to be some overlap there. And they brought in some of their own, you know, people for that crucify him moment. But there, were, there was a crowd was, was there. Here's, here's what I think. I, th- I think they were highly disappointed in Jesus. Jesus did not match their expectation. For Messiah, they had a definition of Messiah. They had a checklist of what Messiah was going to do, what he would look like, and he he didn't match it. Imagine, and it's hard to imagine this, but imagine for us, if you hear this soul-penetrating shout and a trumpet, and you look up like, what was that? And you see the sky receding like a scroll, and you see a rider on a white horse as a conqueror, and you're thinking, yes, right? And he gets about halfway here and says, psych, ha <laughs> and, and turns around and goes back. Uh, and then he goes back and the sky unfolds back as it was and the, the trumpet is silent and the voice is silent. You're, how are you gonna be there at that moment? Because you've just given up every care you've ever had. Every struggle, every sin, uh, every heartbreak, every uh, battle of humankind is gone. You're like, I'm going home. It's over. This, it, uh, it has arrived. Uh, the moment I've been waiting my whole life for. And it got pulled away from you. You'd be, I don't know, depressed? I, I was, and it was like, what did Lazarus feel? when he, he was firmly and solidly in the bosom of Abraham. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And he's like, really? <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, do I have to? And, and he, he, I, mean, I always wonder went through there. That, that, that'd be us. It's like I had heaven uh, at my fingertips and you took it away from me. It may, you might even be angry. I, I don't know. I mean, I, it's hard to be mad at God, but people do. People do that. It, it's hard to process what we would actually think at that moment. I think, though, that's why it's difficult to process what was going on in the moment in these minds of the people of Jerusalem who were there, and, and this messianic buzz was going on. I mean, there's got a week long now heading up to, to Passover, and, and, and all, the, all the check marks have been checked, and all the, you know, the statements, and all the, I mean, everybody's talking from house to house, and person to person, whisper to whisper, and they're, they're plotting and planning, it's time, sharpen your swords, find a sword, do whatever you can, get ready, get ready, get ready. The army is assembling. Just wait for the word. The God-ordained king is here. We're about to turn over Rome. All the stuff they've done to us, we're going to flip it over them, and they'll be sorry they ever did that. They believe Roman rule is about to end, and they're to become, very soon, the new world power. But what Jesus does during these next few days was anything but rally the troops. He's not making military speeches. He's not saying, look, these guys are bad, Rome. We're going to take them out. Come on, religious leaders, let's gather together. Let's all unify. We're taking them out. No, no. What he does is the opposite. He pushes every button of the religious leaders. He calls them names. He starts publicly blasting them and shaming them. I mean, a public humiliation of the leaders, religious leaders of the Israel people. And ultimately, he, he shames them so much that in that culture, especially, they had no choice but to get rid of him and put him to death because that's the only way they could defend their honor. And like the whole law and the prophets rests on them, they think. And, and they're like, we have to defend the God of Israel. We have to get rid of this guy. Complete 
changed. So the crowd sees him acting like an instigator against the Jews rather than the warrior against Rome. They decide that one by one, maybe, maybe he's not the Messiah. There's been several fake messiahs through the, the, the years. Maybe he's just another fake. Let him, let him, he's a fraud. Let him die like the other messiahs. That's where they're at, I believe. Now, now what they didn't know was that the birth of this kingdom that Jesus had been preaching and teaching about for three years, the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is before you, that this kingdom birth could only happen through the death of the king because that would lead to the resurrection of the king. They didn't understand that, so it was all part of the plan, and it all is, is good, but that's what's going on here. And through the resurrection of Jesus and the establishment of the church, the world has turned upside down, in many cases, by the king of kings and the lord of lords, who, who doesn't rule over a small geographical area in the Middle East, but the entire boundless, boundaryless globe. There are Christians everywhere, everywhere. And his lordship is secure. Now, 2,000 years later, he's still stirring cities. He's still stirring the hearts of people. You're here this morning because at some point he stirred something in you and made you seek after him. Like, I've, I've, got, I've got to know. Maybe you were raised and maybe you weren't. Either way, God stirred somewhere in your heart personally and he messed with your soul and he messed with your mind and he messed with your heart and you may not understand everything about him yet, but you know there's something about him you can't deny. There is something about this Jesus. It's why you come. It's not, it's not for me. It's not for the band. It's for Jesus. There's something about him that, 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 that it moves you. It brings you together. Can't deny it. And maybe you haven't thrown your coat on the ground before him, but so many of us have thrown our hearts at the feet of the cross and said, we're in. 100%. We follow you 100%. I will follow you all the days of my life. Wherever you lead me, I will go. Wherever you send me, I will go. Wherever you ask me to do, I will do. No questions asked. I do whatever you say. No matter what the cost, no matter what other people say, no matter how much it hurts, no matter how confused I might be about it, I am absolutely 100% yours. It's Messiah. You know, Jesus never came to invite us uh, to religious activities. Or, or, you know, a safe faith where we just smile and sing happy songs and, and, and just hold hands together. It's okay to do all that stuff, but that's not, he's not ultimately what he, he has called us to. He's called us to pick up our cross and follow him daily. I mean, give it, give it all to him. He, 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 he came for heart, mind, and soul of his followers the war with Rome never happened. It was so much bigger than that. It was a war against sin. The thing that drags us down, and he defeated sin at the cross. It was a war against death. The curse, the original curse from Genesis that gone from creation, or from the fall of man until that moment, he came to fight that war. And death was conquered at the resurrection. And for us, it is conquered it was a war against the enemy of life, Satan himself, and Satan lost. Jesus defeated every single one of them. And he calls you and me to himself so he can defeat them in our lives too. Death has been defeated in you, Christian. Oh, you will die physically someday, but you are eternal. I'd throw some palm branches down for that. That's victory. That is victory. He calls you to him so he can defeat them. So we cry out to him, save us, O king. Save us, son of David. Grant us success against sin and death and all that comes with it. We step down from our personal thrones that we build for ourselves, and we all do, and we throw our coats before the lamb of God, the perfect lamb. And we throw our hearts before him and we declare him Lord and King of our lives. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.